Um, hello, everybody, and welcome both to the folks who are here in person and the folks who are joining us on Zoom. Um, uh, LNC ALDF is really excited to be co-hosting this event with the Center for Animal Law Studies here on campus, and we would first like to thank the Law Scholars for Change program for their generous support and all of you all for attending. Um, but before we get into the logistics, we would like to remember that our academic institution in the so-called Portland metro area rests on stolen traditional and ancestral indigenous homelands of the Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kaplamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, and many other tribes of the Columbia River. Land acknowledgements are an imperfect process, but they are a reminder of our duty to recognize and support indigenous knowledge, creativity, and resi resilience, including fighting for reparations and the land back movement. And centering our work for non-human animal advocacy in this greater context of social justice is a vital component of ensuring that our movement is in solidarity with broader social justice movements overall. Okay, so a few logistics before we get started. This event is being recorded and we will be enabling closed captioning, but please let us know if we can do anything else in terms of accessibility. We will be opening up for questions at the end of the presentation. So if you could save your comments until then, that'll help keep us on schedule. And if you're joining us on Zoom, you can submit your questions in the chat. And then lastly, due to COVID safety precautions, we will be sending around a seating chart in just a moment. So for those of you who are in person, if you could fill that out, just for contact tracing. And then our wonderful vegan lunch will be served to go at the end of the event. So with that being said, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker, Joanne MacArthur. MacArthur is an award-winning photographer, author, and speaker who tells stories of abused and exploited animals and advocates for their rights as sentient beings. In 2019, MacArthur founded We Animals Media, which is um, which brings visibility to hidden animals' lives through compelling photo and video journalism. As the world's leading animal photojournalism agency, the We Animals Media's mission is to document the stories of animals in the human environment, so those used for food, fashion, entertainment, and experimentation, and to connect those stories to the individuals and organizations who can amplify their reach. So the We Animals Media network of award-winning photographers and videographers has created the world's most comprehensive collection of animal photojournalism. And this globally accessible resource is made available for free to anyone working to inspire compassion, conversation, and change, including all of us here in the Animal Law Program. On a personal note, MacArthur was one of my first big inspirations getting into non-human animal advocacy. So I'm personally so excited to have her here with us today. So please join me in welcoming our speaker, Joanne MacArthur. I'm going to take this off. Um, I had a negative COVID test just like literally a few hours ago, so I'm good and we have this protection here. Uh, welcome everyone on Zoom. Welcome everyone. I'm so glad to see you here. Thanks for coming on this little journey with me today as I share my work with you and the work of not uh, just one photo animal photojournalist, but 45 of us now at, uh, at We Animals Media. Okay, <laughs> just getting used to all this. This is great. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, and thanks very much, uh, Professor Tischler and Josie and Megan and everyone who helped get this, uh, uh, put this day together. Much appreciated. Uh, this presentation is called The Role of Photojournalism in Animal Advocacy. Uh, I used to do these presentations with a lot of storytelling, and now I'm going to focus a little bit more on animal photojournalism, what it is, what we're doing, but I can't help but start with a story because I am at heart a storyteller. So what the heck is going on here? This is um, a charter flight full of chickens that has just landed on the U.S. East Coast. To backtrack a little bit, uh, there was a farmer on the West Coast who was farming layer hens, producing eggs, and he had a change of heart, and he didn't want to take part in this cruel practice anymore. He had 3,000 remaining hens, and he called sanctuaries and said, hey, can you take my 3,000 hens? And of course, that's an awful lot. But the sanctuaries banded together and discussed, and some could take 100, some could take 1,000, some could take 10. So of that 3,000, 
1,100 were flown to the East Coast. Uh, we don't know who paid for this charter for 1,100 hens, so we lovingly refer to this person as the henna factor. So the henna factor plane has landed with hens that lived in conditions like these. We don't know. Most people, I know you know, most people don't know that animals live in conditions like these and worse. Uh, cages used to be just along the ground and now they're stacked vertically. This is what a typical industrial hen egg laying hen farm looks like. Uh, so this is me and some investigator colleagues and this is one of the hundreds of thousands of birds I met that night. So back to this lovely rescue. The plane has landed. These are two sanctuary staff and they are just so worried and anxious and excited to get those birds out of the cages. And how wonderful to see, you know, 3000 birds down to 1100, down to 10 per crate. And I just love how excited they are there to, to get, those, get those birds down out of the crate and to sanctuary. So here we have a large number of these hens touching down on grass for the very first time. Many of them were emaciated and had medical problems. Uh, this bird is getting subcutaneous fluids. All of the birds had nails like this, totally overgrown because they had only ever stood on cage flooring. They all had mites and so each were given a dust bath and here is one, debeaked. Uh, debeaking is a, is a process that many birds undergo in this country and many others so that they don't peck each other to death in those tiny cages. But here is one, her name is Jolene. And she is one of the 10 of the 1100 of the 3000, but really one of billions who are farmed every single year. And so, that's my job is to show the size of industry, to expose these industries, but to also show the individuals. Uh, you'll see a lot of eye contact in my images. It's really important because that's how we connect, isn't it? We have a common language. We don't have a common language with them, but eye contact speaks volumes. So about photojournalism, which I have always been passionately in love with, I was inspired by conflict photographers. I was inspired by people who went out into the world and put themselves in danger to tell an important story. But photojournalism ultimately is about the human condition. Whereas I was moving in the direction, even though I didn't know it at the time, of animal photojournalism. And it started, um, and animal photojournalism includes everyone, not just we animals. Uh, it started in 1998. I didn't know it at the time. I was just finding my ground and taking quite poor pictures, in fact, just getting my footing. And this is an old picture. It's a picture of an old print. It's one of my first images of an animal in captivity. And I was having a nice backpacking escapade in Ecuador. And I came across this uh, monkey who was chained up. And there were a bunch of people around me, other hikers and tourists, taking the same picture that I was taking. And they were taking it because they thought this was funny, cute, entertaining. But I was taking the picture because I thought this was awful and maybe I could do something with this picture. And I realized in that moment that I saw animals differently than other people did. And probably my point of view was more important than their point of view for the animals. And it was also one of those aha moments about how the camera can be such an incredible tool for change. That's my number one favorite thing about the camera. And, you know, it's been used that way for a very, very long time. How many of you know this image? Right. This, this is uh, Gordon, a runaway slave. And this was one of the first images that really documented the harshness and reality of what it was to be a slave. And it was one of the first images to be published nationally. It galvanized people. And it was an instance where photojournalism was one piece of the puzzle when it came to creating a uh, broader change and ultimately it was one of the things that helped uh, end slavery. Now skip ahead 100 years and we all know these images as well. And um, when you think about the Vietnam War, often people 
the, vis the only visual that comes to mind is, you know, the napalm girl and the soldier being shot. These were Pulitzer Prize winning images that helped end the Vietnam War. And that's what I want to do with and for, for rather, for animals who are our, our clients, aren't they? I mean, especially people in this room. I see the animals as our clients and I know you do as well. And, and so it's been a, you know, almost two, probably two decades now, more than two decades <laughs> of um, photographing the hidden animals. Conservation photography and wildlife photography, they're doing their thing. They're often photographing the charismatic animals or the animals that are sort of acceptable to look at, you know, insects and other interesting creatures. But all of these hidden animals, these billions, uh, we don't want to look at them because that's convenient, uh, because we have, uh, you know, intrinsic daily use of them. And so they're hidden from us through you know, economic reasons and industry, et cetera. So these are the animals I go to when they are in transport. I do investigative work at factory farms. Uh, this is a, what they call a broiler chicken. Um, Broiler chickens are generally uh, sent to slaughter at 42 days of age, and they're still peeping at that age. They're still babies, but their bodies have been uh, genetically formed to grow really, really quickly. And sometimes by age uh, day 42, they can no longer even stand, uh, hold up their body on those legs. And so I go to them. I go to the fur farms globally. This is calico fox. A lot of people don't know that we factory farm alligators even for... Uh, their flesh and for their skins. This is in New Orleans. I photograph animals used for work. I photograph animals used in research. This is a macaque breeding facility in Southeast Asia. I'll return to that story later. And something really interesting about the hidden animals is that they're often in plain view, like Kiska. And this was another case of me and all the people around me taking the exact same picture. Um, but, you know, there was more that I wanted to do with this picture and, um, and why it's called photojournalism as well as because it's about the journalism side, which I love, and it's about the investigative work. And this image really comes to life when you hear about her story. So she was wild caught off the coast of Iceland in 1979. She was, um, transported to marine land in Canada. This tank is ironically called Friendship Cove. She lives there alone. So she's been in there since 1979 and it takes her about one minute, less than a minute in fact, to circumnavigate the tank. Uh, she was artificially inseminated five times, gave birth five times and all of her babies died. Animals who are in plain view, like Luke when he's performing, same thing. All the people around me, the person right in front of me there are taking that same image. But what can you discover when you stay longer, look farther, think critically? Those are the stories that I want to reach people. This is Luke behind the scenes. He's chained up, he's swaying back and forth. There's a hose on the bottom left, a power pressure hose, and he's strained against the shackles to reach for it so that he would have something to do, something to touch. And he did reach it and he played with it for a moment, but then people came and took it away from him. And I find it so interesting that um, there are those three women in the background, literally ignoring the elephant in the room. I'm just gonna let some more people into the, into the Zoom. Welcome to the new people. Uh, we're just about a third of the way into the presentation. And unlike wildlife photography and some conservation photography, animal photojournalism is very much about we animals and the decisions we make, the things we do, our lack of critical thinking, the constructs in which we keep animals. I was taking this image of um, uh, a bullfighting school. And this little boy is six years old, maybe eight years old. And uh, the group, I was with Animal Equality and they asked in Spanish, why do you want to be a bullfighter when you grow up? And he said, because I love bulls. Interesting. So I promise this is the only reading from the slides that I'll be doing. 
Um, but we, we really labored over this definition of animal photojournalism, and I want to break it down a little bit for you all. Uh, we Animals Media and I founded a, founded, create a new, created a new genre of uh, photography. We called it Animal Photojournalism, APJ for short. And when we put this out into the world, I really thought there would be a lot of backlash because who am I to create a new genre of, uh, of photography? But wonderfully, uh, it's being, from what I can see so far, like pretty globally accepted as a genre of photography that is inevitable because the other genres sort of exclude, you know, exclude hidden animals, especially wildlife and conservation photography. And so we gave it a definition, which I'll, I'll walk through with you. APJ is an emergent genre of photography that captures, memorializes, and exposes the experiences of animals who live amongst us, but who we fail to see. At its core, the images of this pioneering field document the broader human-animal conflict and its resultant ecosystems of suffering. Uh, this is an image I shot in Taiwan. Uh, we often don't know that cows are tethered like that so that they can't kick, so that they can't move quickly. So this is a practice that exists. And this is an image from South Korea, I, I believe, from an anonymous photographer. And uh, what's happening here is that there's a threat of zoonotic disease. And so um, I don't know how many animals were killed that day or at that farm, but it could have been upward of millions. And they are being rounded up and dropped into a hole in the ground, and then they will be covered up. And this is a standard practice for killing animals um, in mass quantities. More on APJ. From public and environmental health crises to zoonotic viruses, animals are inextricably linked to many areas of current global concern. Our existence is intertwined, of course, we forget that. And the ethics of how we treat other sentient beings is being called into question. APJ aims to encourage swift and necessary change on behalf of the beings in the frame. So it's very political work, it's very active work. It's with AP, you know, with some photography, you take a picture, you take a good picture, and that's the end of the story, right? You got it. But with APJ, you take a good image, and that's where the work starts. That's where you start getting it out into the media, into conversations with NGOs and into the world. Uh, what you're seeing here is a flooded factory farm. Uh, I was down at the floods in North Carolina. An estimated 5.5 million birds died. Uh, animals are considered inventory. That is the word that is used. They're covered by insurance. Um, so an estimated 5.5 million <laughs> inventory, I guess you would say, uh, died and thousands of pigs as well. It was absolutely impossible to evacuate that number of animals from, uh, from a flood zone or from a disaster zone, zone. So literally the people leave and you know wish the animals good luck. I'm not saying that the farmers aren't uh, are insensitive to the death of the animals, but this is the reality for those farmed animals. Like photojournalism and conflict photography, animal photojournalism off, often takes the form of an in-depth reportage or photo essay. It's relevant to current news and it shapes conversations about its subject matter. Additionally, APJ is used to further political, philosophical, and scientific thinking. Many APJs are invested in contributing to current worldwide campaigns to lessen and end animal exploitation. And we go to great lengths to get these images, whether it's uh, uh, undercover investigations, um, plain regular investigations, where we're plain regular, what does that mean? Um, not employment based is what that means. So going into farms at night, documenting things as they are, climbing trucks, um, buying tickets into places we don't necessarily want to go to, to document. Uh, this is me at the Turkish-Bulgarian border, uh, climbing a lot of trucks for a whole week and shooting until people would, people would shoo me away. <laughs> I was with a great group, in fact, called uh, Eyes on Animals, and I would climb the trucks and they would talk to people <laughs> about what was going on there. And, but that's a whole other story, I'll stop there. So to this definition, um, as with conflict photographers, APJs must put themselves in physical and psychological risk in order to document a practice or an event. In common with the humanitarian and conflict photographers, animal photojournalists can also suffer long-term psychological effects as a result of bearing witness to violence and injustice towards others. 
um, investigators like me don't have a long uh, career often because the work is just so difficult. It's an uphill battle. And I'll circle back to, to that as well about taking care of ourselves. Here is an image of a zoo in Germany. Um, I have photographed zoos from the worst roadside zoos to the biggest and the best. Um, this is considered one of the biggest and the best. It is quite clean and beautiful, and yet. Images in this new genre demand radical empathy and self-awareness. I love that. Viewers must decenter themselves and consider the world through the eyes of a different species while holding the truth of humanity's <laughs> undeniable role in the story. There's a pretty fantastic book by political activist, Susan Sontag. She wrote a book called Regarding the Pain of Others. It's mostly about humans, uh, but one of the theses is, you know, who should have to look at unpleasant images? Because of course, none of us want to. And the answer is anyone who can help. And when it comes to animal use, every single one of us should be looking because every single one of us is used as animals in some way. And so uh, We Animals Media and I created a book, uh, a calling card about APJ. Uh, this is it here. It is a five pound colossus of a book. We made a book because we want to memorialize these animals. We want to you know, give it physically, figuratively as much weight as possible. And so that's why people make books, of course, just like conflict photographers. There's a lot of books on war photography and, and that's what this is. And we, um, we don't want the images just zipping by on social media, and, you know, gone into the wind. So we've made this. Uh, I apologize for the next image, it's graphic, but there is a point to, uh, to showing you. It's so interesting, like the fact that I just apologized for it. I'm, I'm still not sure why I do that. Um, I think it's because it's actually still so hard on me. I don't even want to see these images. So I, I feel empathetic towards you who are seeing them, even though the point, of course, is for you to see them. Uh, this book came together. So I had the idea for the book many years ago when I saw a book called Inferno by James Noctway. He's a famous conflict photographer, and he did this book of you know, decades of his work on genocides and famines and refugee migrations and all these things that we do to one another. He created this big tome of a book. And when I looked at it, I knew that animals needed such a book. And it took a few years to put it all together and it actually came together this night, this very night. I was at a wet market in Asia and um, I packed up my bags, it was 5 a.m. I was exhausted and very, very sad and I was leaving, but just as I was leaving at the door were the soft shell turtles, one after the other, having their, uh, their shells carved off them while they were alive. And, um, and I stayed and I filmed and my videographer filmed and we watched and watched and watched the agony they were going through. And I got back to the hotel that night and took major action because that's how I cope with seeing things like this. And I'm very fortunate that I have an outlet like photojournalism and We Animals Media, because that's what we do. Like that's the catharsis for me, it's taking action. And so I mapped out how, how I wanted to do this book. I mapped out my dream contributors, my dream collaborators, like my editor, Keith Wilson, David Griffin, he's a, a National Geographic uh, book uh, designer. And, and we did it and we, we fundraised for it as well. We did a, a crowdfunding campaign and we had a really, really high goal of about, Linda, was it like 60,000? Um, I think it was. I mean, we aimed for 60,000, I think. I thought it was like 130 Canadian. <laughs> it was really high. I think it was really high. And I was worried we wouldn't get that amount, but we actually raised that amount in three and a half days. And then by the end of the campaign, we had uh, made a quarter of a million dollars for this book. And so we were able to print more and do more and get it out into the world and have the best of everything. That's we were able to see the photographers and, and um, we've been submitting the book to uh, humanitarian photo festival competitions and wildlife festivals. And one photography <laughs> book of the year is like over <laughs> thousands of other books and <laughs> humanitarian books that win or the art books that win. 
And uh, so we're really, really proud of how it's doing, how it's getting out into the world. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix wrote our introduction. We kept the text quite sparse. Uh, we could have fit thousands of photos in this book, but we wanted every page to just, you know, have a lot of space. And so you see, you know, two page spreads in almost, uh, on almost every page. And, um, and so, of course, we look at the, mainly the food animals, the farmed animals. This is a quote by conservation photographer Brent Sturton. I love it. Photography is a weapon against what's wrong out there. It's bearing witness to the truth. Uh, this is a, the last chick to fall into a macerator. The chick is macerated, macerated uh, for the crime of being born male is the male chicks are useless. They don't lay eggs uh, by photographer Jan van Eyken. He's Dutch. Uh, the book includes images of foie gras production. This is by uh, very well-known photojournalist, Luis Tato. We look at the climate crisis as well. Uh, this is a kangaroo in a burnt plantation. And I, I think it's interesting as well that this isn't even her natural home. First of all, her home has been devastated but it's not even a natural home, it's a plantation. We look at wet markets. We look at the results of zoonotic diseases. This is the, um, several decades ago now, the hoof and mouth, was that, was that what it was called? Foot and mouth disease in the UK. And animals and entertainment, Ator Garmendia shot this and animals, used in culture, this is considered culture. What I like about culture is that it changes. Cultures and traditions change, they evolve, thank goodness. And that's what our book is aiming to do is to help usher that evolution. The book is full of uh, well-researched facts as well. Very important. And then the book ends with this image and it speaks for itself, doesn't it? It doesn't need the storytelling like Kis Kiska Bjorka does. Now, I realize this work disables, uh, not disables, uh, sort of paralyzes people. And I used to think that I could hold up an image that I had shot and say, look at this. And someone would say, oh my God, I'm never participating in that again. But that's not how things work, unfortunately, as I've learned. And, um, you know, I think I used to be an angry, animal activist and an angry vegan until you know I've come around to knowing that you know I eat animals half my life and people need encouragement they don't need to be yelled at and and so I'm like the most supportive animal rights activist ever now and it's like it's much more effective and you know I do I do realize oh I'm gonna admit some people to the room okay hello new person <laughs> um yeah so our work at We Animals Media does a lot of hand-holding as well. It does a lot, looks at a lot of solutions. So this is a leaflet that's in the book that you can fold out. It's really beautiful. And it's about you know, the way forward, things that we can all do. We can change the law. Uh, we can vote, we can adopt, not shop, all these wonderful things. And by extension, we have this fantastic project called Unbound. This started about six or seven years ago. As I was traveling around the world, I could see that it was mostly women in animal advocacy. And I didn't question that. I wondered if that was because I had a biased perspective or because I was a feminist. So I did some research and saw that, yes, in fact, uh, at least in Europe and North America, the animal advocacy movement is made up of 60 to 80% women. And yet it's often men in a position of leadership or men at the, you know, doing the media and getting the visibility. And so I created a project called Unbound. To date, we've featured over 60 women globally who are doing pioneering work, or maybe they're not doing pioneering work. Maybe they're just doing hard work. And this, uh, this project is such a pleasure. How many of you know this person? <laughs> This is Miyoko Shinner. You may have had her cheese, Miyoko's cheese. So just last week, I was at her sanctuary and at her cheese plant. Like, come on. <laughs> it's amazing. And she uh, announced recently additional capital investment of 50 million. 
uh, her, she's just going so global, so big. And so the project honors people like Miyoko, entrepreneurs. Uh, I took this photo yesterday. This is Erin Wing. She's an investigator. She spent two years at, her, at farms working with Animal Outlook, who Belinda works with as well. And she has come out now and she's doing interviews. And so she's allowing herself to be interviewed and photographed. And so Unbound is featuring and honoring Erin Wing. And this was at Wildwood Sanctuary yesterday. How many of you know about or have been to Wildwood? Okay, well, it's about an hour away. Belinda's on the board. You can ask her about it afterwards if you want. And it's a really, really stunning sanctuary. We feature politicians like Marianne Time. At the time she was the founder of, well, at the time, she was the founder of the Dutch Party for Animals. Look at all the women in this picture. <laughs> so she's at the center. And um, they've done so much in Holland. It's quite incredible. Her, her, their ultimate goal as a party is to end industrial farming in that country. So I've been all over the world photographing these stories. Uh, this is Sepuwe Tole. She is one of the Black Mambas. They are an all, yeah, all female anti-poaching unit in South Africa. So I got to go out in the field with them, but I also got, got to go to classrooms with them where they do humane education. I've met all sorts of people, sanctuary founders, lawyers, chefs. That's Rabia Hawa on the bottom left. She's the first female Muslim park ranger in Kenya. Oh, and uh, uh, Dr. De Aluha in Mexico, top center. When she started at vet school in Mexico, there was no women's bathroom because <laughs> there were no women at that school in vet school. So she was one of the very, uh, she was the second in Mexico to go to vet school. This is Dr. Theodora Capaldo, dear friend of mine. And she was the president of the New England Anti-Vivisection Society for several decades. And I like that I got to photograph her with uh, with a rat who are of course commonly used in research. And this quote by her really says it all for me. It's all the same really, the environment, women, children, civil rights, the animals, it's all about the same thing, compassion and doing what's right for everyone. I get to see so much progress. Uh, we know that things continue to be bad for animals, but we also know that things continue to change in, uh, in so many ways. And that's why it's an exciting time, I think, to be part of the animal advocacy movement. We're seeing animal law, we're seeing growth in veganism and all these things. So this is Prince, he agrees, <laughs> eat your veggies. <laughs> he actually ate that whole thing. He wasn't just posing. <laughs> and uh, I remember not so long ago when a lot of veggie food didn't taste so great or it was just beans and rice, but you know, that's, this is what it looks like now. Now, you can't possibly know what this is, or maybe you do. Uh, this was a shoot from just a few days ago at the Better Meat Company. This is also at the Better Meat Company. And so what they are doing is uh, fermenting fungi and making a mycoprotein that is really tasty. So the other day I had a mycoprotein steak and a burger. <laughs> Actually, it was really funny because they, you know, they make the steak and they bring it out for someone like me who's you know, writing and photographing about it. And I think you're supposed to just like have a bite and, and taste it, but I ate the whole thing. It's like, this is so good. <laughs> and I kind of realized afterwards it was probably meant to be shared by a bunch of people. <laughs> it was really, really good. And uh, so this, these are the, the fermentation machines and it was so sexy like this this is the future and you know photographing this reminded me of this so this is a cleaned post slaughter uh, slaughterhouse in turkey that i had visited and i was looking at the chrome and the red floors and i was looking at the chrome and the red floors and it was like okay this really is the future i felt so optimistic so this is like you know a fungi a fungi slaughterhouse as opposed to you know the what is current and what needs to be made history. So many of us are now speaking up to our political representatives, more and more parties worldwide are incorporating pro-animal initiatives into their policies. This was in Canada when hundreds of people came down to City Hall to have their five minutes <laughs> day uh, to help put a ban on the import of shark fin products. It was really sweet to see so many people dressed up as, as shark, sharks, I thought that was nice. A lot of people are working on a ban on puppy mills. I hope that we see that in my lifetime. Let's see. 
Uh, this is with Humane Society International. Uh, this puppy mill was, um, all the animals were seized that day. So 110 dogs were rescued. We will see a closure of all unaccredited and roadside zoos. We will see a continued expansion of sanctuary, rescue and compassionate conservation efforts instead of zoos and aquaria. What I'd like to see with those really big world-class zoos are turning them into uh, wildlife uh, rehab centers because we will always need big, amazing, credible places to uh, re uh, rehab and release. Earlier on, I showed you an image of a macaque in a breeding facility. So back to that story and how I'm seeing change through animal photojournalism and through the organizations that I work with. Um, a filmmaker and I were investigating macaque facilities, breeding facilities in Southeast Asia. And this is one of them. And the farmhand is literally showing us his product. So that was the word that was used, just like we used the word inventory uh, earlier. It was absolutely devastating. We were posing as buyers. That's why we had this access. That's why he's showing us his product. But as a result of the investigative work we did, which was presented, which was given to the British Union for the Abolition of Vivisection, which was presented at the CITES Convention in Geneva the following year, two of those three farms that we visited closed down. And this used to be a fur farm. The investigative work that we did was given as an anonymous dossier to an SPCA. They obtained a warrant to go to the farm and they confiscated all of the animals. Um, many of them had to be euthanized, but many of them were brought to, uh, to sanctuary. And so this place, this was the, fir this, the first criminal, federal criminal charges of a fur farmer in Canada. And so he won't be fur farming anymore. This is in France at a circus. And a few years after I took these pictures with the work of many, many, many NGOs, the use of animals in circuses was banned in France. I'm not taking credit for that. I'm just saying what I love about my job is that I get to contribute to all of these incredible efforts. People ask me about the, uh, oh, we know what to do with this now, huh? <laughs> Activate the screen again. Um, I took this photo of Belinda yesterday at Wildwood with the new calf named Lola, right? And um, people ask me about how I'm able to to do this work long term. And I've mentioned a little bit about action being catharsis, but um, I, this quote really resonated for me. Compassion hurts. When you feel connected to everything, you also feel responsible for everything. We should change that, eh? That's the quote, but you also feel responsible for everyone and you cannot turn away. You must grow strong enough to love the world, yet empty enough to sit down at the same table with its worst horrors. And that's certainly what we're doing in the animal advocacy movement, isn't it? And um, I'm able to do this by, you know, just focusing on what I can do day after day. And sometimes that's a lot and sometimes that's a little. And um, I don't focus on big picture. For me, that's a total animal liberation. But I think I would feel very tired if that was my goal every day. And so back to, you know, one foot in front of the other, community building, working with others. And slowly we're getting there. Dr. Tischler, sorry to um, embarrass you, but <laughs> um, I photographed Joyce Tischler for the Unbound project a few years ago. So we're so proud to have her as part of Unbound. And, and uh, that was a fun photo shoot. And you know, tenacity, like you have it. And we need to have that. Uh, there's so much innovation happening in animal advocacy and there's a lot to celebrate. And so celebrate, we must. Um, you founded the ALDF in 1979, where there really wasn't animal law at the time. And now look, like pretty incredible. So what a role model <laughs> for me. I'll stop <laughs> for lots of us. And um, one, one last story and we will wrap up. This is Ron and Ron, I took this photo after he was rescued. And he had been used in research for oh, two and a half decades. 
and he lived in a five by five by seven cage suspended above the ground, the way some people might keep a canary. So a chimpanzee was kept that way. He was used in invasive research. And, um, and uh, that was with Save the Chimps. Save the Chimps rescued him. And we had access to all of his files. So I was able to read his files and learn about what he had undergone. Uh, he was part of a spinal dynamic study in which a disc in his neck was removed and he wasn't given pain medication for eight days. Imagine if one of us had gone through that. Imagine if he had gone through that, which he had. Um, but you know, what I also found out was that he and I were the exact same age. We were born two months apart in 1976. And I thought about the chronology of our lives. I thought about how when I was eight years old, I was out climbing trees, but you know, he should have been climbing trees. He's the chimpanzee. When I was in university, I was studying. He was being studied. His charts, charts show that uh, he was once darted, sedated 16 times in a five week period and on and on. But when Ron and I were 26, he was rescued by Save the Chimps. And that's where I took this picture of him. He had a whole sanctuary space within which to roam with other chimpanzees, but he always chose to stay indoors where he felt safe. And he would make this nest around him, which is what you see here. And he had a lot to be angry about, but he was so kind and uh, caring to all the chimpanzees and all the humans around. And, he was known as just the most loving and, and gentle individual. And um, I love the eye contact. And what's so important about that eye contact, eye contact as a photographer is that any animal looking at me is looking out at all of you. And um, we just don't have a common language and we use that as an excuse to treat animals terribly. I will add, I did actually meet chimpanzees once with a common language because they had been used um, in behavioral studies and they were taught sign language. And um, I met them when they were rescued, they were at a sanctuary. And one of the chimpanzees came over to my friend and I and signed to my friend who was holding a cup. And the chimpanzee asked in sign language, is that coffee? <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> we were flabbergasted and through the translator, we answered yes. And then the chimpanzee asked, can I have your coffee with milk? <laughs> <laughs> and how jaw droppingly awe inspiring to have a common language. It's just impossible, you know, but we can't assume as we always do that there's no one behind those eyes. And with our supremacy complex, we just you know, assume because we can't talk with them that there's, there's no one behind there. And I'm really glad that animal photojournalism can help be a part of changing that, help build a common language. Photography is a common language um, because we can understand it and eye contact is a common language. And so I would like to think, I don't wanna speak for Ron, but maybe I will a little bit here. Uh, in my work, what we ask is for people to not turn away. Um, it's so hard to look at these images, it's so painful, but we animals media asks, please don't turn away. And I think Ron would probably be asking the same. And I think all animals are asking the same. When I look at animals in the factory farms and everywhere that I go, what their eyes are telling me is always the same. It's what are you going to do to me? It's fear they are scared and they're asking with their eyes and every body movement, what are you going to do to me? What's going to happen next? And what a terrible legacy for us, but we can change that. <laughs> and so on behalf of myself and Ron and all the animals you've met today, thank you for looking. Thank you so much for not turning away. And thank you for having me here today. Um, so I would love to open up to questions first to the folks in the room, if anybody has a burning desire, and if not, I can go into the chat and look at what folks are asking on there. Yeah. I would love to hear what you and the photographers you work with do for self-care. Um, 
with how heavy this work is and how you kind of sustain um, yourselves through this process. So the question is, how do we look after ourselves in this work, myself and other APJs? Well, it's different for all of us, of course. Um, and uh, I talked a little bit about just focusing on what I can do every day, uh, but that was a process. I you know, have gone through depression and diagnosed with PTSD and a lot of time people bow out at that point because it's unbearable and I understand that, um, but we need to you know, be able to have all the tools to take care of ourselves and, and to have longevity in this work because there's so few of us in animal advocacy and the animals need us to stick around. And I would say that it was a very long process for me of having therapy and also having uh, a healthy compartmentalization of what I'm seeing. So I'm very well aware that there's immense suffering at every moment of every day. But if I'm to immerse myself emotionally in that at the same time, I will be unhappy and exhausted. And I just have this one short, precious life to live and I wanna live it happily and I do. And so I can have those two things running, running parallel. Um, I don't shut myself off from the suffering because I don't think I would be a good and passionate uh, photographer if I, if I shut myself off. In fact, I keep myself wide open to all of the suffering in the world, uh, which impassions me to, to work hard. Um, but I would say that it was a process and everyone's process is different. Um, I also think that we as a species have a very messed up relationship with suffering. Uh, we tend to just think suffering is bad, push it away. I mean, we should all try and alleviate one another's suffering, but um, closing ourselves off to it is just gonna hurt. It doesn't fix anything, but like whenever we face suffering, we can use it as an opportunity to help, to speak up, to take part in change. And, and that, is, that is empowering instead of diminishing and I, I wish that we could all be taught to have a different relationship with suffering. Lastly, uh, I'll mention Patrice Jones's book called Aftershock, and it's written particularly for animal advocates and uh, how to help us cope with the trauma of the world, especially in animal advocacy. So Aftershock by Patrice Jones. Thank you so much. Welcome. That was really helpful for me too, as I'm sure it was for lots of folks. Um, so we have a few questions in the chat. So Santiago asks, have you visited an insect farm and what do you think about in insects being sentient? I have not uh, photographed at an insect farm yet. And uh, of course there's sentience, complex animals. And I don't think that that's the answer to, uh, you know, to feeding seven, eight, nine billion people. I think that there's enough science out there for us to know now that, you know, we can, we can farm produce, uh, non-sentient beings to feed the world. So I hope that this is a, a short uh, trend that we're in right now. Great, and then I have a quick question, if that's okay. Um, I'm wondering if folks are watching this who might be interested in pursuing animal photojournalism, what advice you would have for them? I'm so glad you asked that <laughs> because we have lots of resources. One of the things that we do at We Animals Media is mentor. And uh, so two things, we have a masterclass. I was just for many years getting a ton of emails from people asking about coping or how do you do what you do? How do you investigate? How do you light? Um, and, and how do you get the work out into the world? And so we created a, a masterclass. It's two and a half hours, self-guided, eight episodes with uh, a program that you can follow as well. And um, it's $45 and it's on our website, We Animals Media, which is there. Canadian, so it's less than US. It's less than US dollars. <laughs> so it's like 30, 35 US or so. And, um, and so it's funny, we, we put a lot of time and money and resources into that resource. And I was a little worried that it was for nothing, but no, I think to date, 
and this was a number from a few months ago, over 400 people have purchased the, the masterclass, which makes me so happy. And it's such a niche thing, right? Animal photojournalism, but people are really interested. And so we have the masterclass and we have our first fellowship. Uh, the applications are coming in right now and the deadline is November 14th. And um, this is a paid fellowship. It's 6,400 Canadian and it's to help someone create and complete um, a project on factory farming, factory farmed animals. And we have one fellowship for next year, but we hope to add more and more of them once we build our finances and capacity. Uh, yes, so. Amazing. Um, okay, I'm just gonna check the chat really quick and see if we can take maybe we have a lot of thank yous. People are extremely moved and inspired by everything that you shared with us. Um, if nobody else in person has any questions, um, the food is here. So I think we might just talk and um, all discuss all the different things that we have to think about now that we've gotten that phenomenal presentation. Um, I would like to just have all of us thank you once more for coming and talking to us. It really is one of the things that keeps us going in the work that we do here. So thank you so much.